Hello and welcome to Season 3 of The Push Podcast. My name is Jack Ferguson, an experienced marketing and sales consultant with a science background, and I'm your host. This season of the podcast is essential listening for small and medium-sized companies looking for their next stage of growth. Myself and other experts will explore common problems in marketing, product, and sales. We will deconstruct them and then detail straightforward, evidence-based remedies for you. I aim to give you both inspiration and practical solutions to push through similar challenges in your own company. Thanks for being here and don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. Hello and welcome to a new season of The Push Podcast. It has been some time between episodes and it's great to be back in your ears again. I'm really excited about this season and a new podcast format. Episodes will be shorter than before and will have a well thought through narrative that should be easy for you to follow and consume. Each episode will tackle specific marketing product or sales problem scenarios. These scenarios will reflect real world problems and detailed remedies will be prescribed. This season is perfect for CEOs and GMs of mid-sized companies who are having issues with marketing and sales outcomes. It's also for marketing professionals who want to level up or salespeople who want an insight into the world of marketing, and really anybody with an interest in marketing, product, or sales. First up, this episode will deal with a common issue that comes up between sales and marketing teams. The issue that we're going to look at is around branding, and the common claims from marketing teams or marketers that good branding results in leads just happening. Marketing teams tend to think this is true, Sales teams tend to be more skeptical of this claim. We're going to explore this problem through a fictional development company, AppCrafter Studios, who have had issues with growing revenue beyond $15 million AUD. In fact, revenue has stubbornly stayed the same for two years. They're not growing. So what should CEO Sarah do about this? How does she get revenue growing again? And are the marketing team right when they say that good branding is the answer? To talk through the details, I'm joined on this episode by growth and product marketing specialist, Alex Urquhart. Some of the specifics this episode will cover include how you can measure brand, what branding is, what is brand salience and why it's important, the brand spectrum of sophistication, whether the marketing team should be talking to customers or not, why sales and marketing rarely work well together, and of course, whether the marketing team are right when they say that good branding will result in leads just happening. If you would like to find myself or Alex online, you can find the links to our social media pages and websites in this episode's description, whatever platform you're listening on. But now, let's bring in Alex and hear a bit more about AppCrafter Studios and their issues. Okay, good to see you today, Alex. Thanks for coming in to chat with me. You too, mate. Great to be here. Great to, great to be talking to you. So, in this season, we're going to be going through some hypothetical examples of situations where businesses are in a bit of trouble and you and I, being the brilliant sales and marketing and growth and product people we are, are going to fix their problems. So, we're going to go through an example of a company, AppCrafter Studios, today and I'm going to tell all you listeners what this company should be doing. So, Feel free to play along at home. Alex, what's going on with this company? So, AppCrafter Studios. Today, we're analyzing AppCrafter Studios, uh, a mid-sized software development company in Sydney's harbour front. Despite CEO Sarah Thompson's unwavering optimism, revenue has stubbornly hovered around 15 million, roughly 10 million USD for the past two years. The vibrant team of 50 employees, three sharp salespeople, and three creative marketers uh, starting to feel the heat as revenue won't budge. So that's 15 million AUD, roughly 10 million USD. Correct, correct. And the the breakdown, the revenue breakdown of that is new clients is about 6 million AUD, uh, slow and steady, uh, barely keeping them above churn. And then reoccurring revenue is 9 million AUD, so solid, um, but new clients aren't being added. The team uh, said comprised of three marketers, uh, which are a content marketing manager, Barry, a digital marketing specialist, Jane, a brand specialist, Emma, um, and they outsource a lot of their creative work to an agency. The sales team comprised of a senior BDM, Bruce, a junior BDM, Layla, and an outsourced, uh, outbound specialist, Dave. 
They sell custom mobile app development and they have a wide and diverse client base, potentially explaining the difficulty in targeting the right audience. At this stage, they don't have a niche. Uh, They build products for real estate, construction, hospitality, and other cleaning groups. But here's the problem. The marketing team are hell-bent on working on just brand, and they think that leads will just happen with enough good branding. They also don't believe in talking to the customers. They think that's the sales job, but sales disagrees. How would you handle this situation, and what is your advice? Oh, this has never happened before, has it, Alex? Oh, I'm very <laughs> ominous. I've never heard of this before in my life. <laughs> well, marketing and sales aren't getting along. Okay. <laughs> All right. You hear it. You heard it here first on the po- Push podcast. We're going to analyze a situation that's never happened before. In Hopefully, the- people can try to emulate with this and try to understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Well, anyway, so there is a bit to unpack here. So, so when the marketing team are talking about brand or branding, firstly, I wanted to have a chat about these words and what they mean. What is brand? Uh, I know the origins of brand go back a long, long time. There's evidence of that in 2700 BC, roughly, in ancient Egypt. Wow. Uh, yeah, where there's evidence that cows were branded. So, why did they do that? To say that this cow is mine. And the implication is obviously that that's superior to someone else's cow. Interesting. So, a brand, what does it do? So, that will help you to differentiate something from a commodity. Hmm. A generic cow's not as good as my cow that's branded Jack. So Jack's cows are pretty high value these days. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there is some advantages of brand to consumers. So they're familiar. So being humans, we like what's familiar and that's what we've considered safe over time and that's what's kept us alive. So so a brand is familiar to someone. It, it does reduce search costs, so a cognitive load if you're going to buy a computer and you just think Apple, you don't need to go search for computers and go through that whole process. You can just access that memory and you go, okay, that's done. I don't need to do do the big uh, search for it. Another useful application of brand to a consumer is perceived quality. So Mm, perceived quality. I know what Apple is. I think it's good quality. It's familiar. Here's some of the, the advantages. So I'm not sure if you have a definition of brand I would say you've pretty much summed it up. I think brand is the personality of the product or of the company. I think it's, yeah, to your saying before, if if you knew you've got to justify yourself and start from the ground up, but if you're if you're Apple, everyone knows Apple, everyone mm-hmm. knows Microsoft, everyone knows McDonald's, and it's it's a matter of just probably getting in front of them to make sure they're there and um yeah, trust and sort of who you are really. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think so, one of the sorry, I was gonna say one of the best things I've heard was brand. Um you should be able to picture what that person would look like if that company was a person. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I haven't heard of that before. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. All right. They do, uh, I will note though, brands have different power in different categories. So Byron Sharp, president of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, famously, well, not so much famously, but he often says, what brand of microwave do you have? And the common answer is people don't know. So in certain categories, brand doesn't necessarily carry the same weight. Do you know the microwave brand you have? No, uh, no, I don't at all. No, it's a good point. I was going to say Cambrook maybe if I take a guess, but I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. so um, in those categories, you may want to just be there when people are looking as opposed to realistically being able to build a memory, build an association with a brand. So different categories, different applications. But when it comes to this marketing team who are at App Crafter Studios and what they are talking about when they mean we're working on just brand or doing branding. So firstly, I don't actually like the word branding. I don't like that it's a verb. Uh, the, your brand to me is what the market thinks of you, uh, the associations they have with your brand. Your brand salience is if you come to mind in a buying situation, which I'll talk about brand salience a bit later. And your brand awareness is how many people know of you. So to me, it's it's something you are, not something you do. You can influence your brand, but you don't control it. And I I do find the term branding used as a verb to be Mm. (laughs) self-indulgent and imply the associated activities uh, to have more influence over how the brand is received when what they actually do. So your brand to me is going to be judged as one brand and people are going to look at all their interactions with your brand to judge it. And all this is going to happen subconsciously, obviously. They're not, they don't have a note, um, Mm. notepad out and and saying, oh, this ad was nice, I'm going to give them two points. Their uh, service was poor, so I'm going to mark them down. People aren't making explicit 
marks, you know, or notes on on your brand. It's just something that's influenced by anything they touch and by what someone else says about you. Mm. It's it's influenced in all sorts of ways. But the thing here for me is your brand's going to be judged as one brand. And there are many touch points that will influence that and beyond comms and advertising, which is where when people think of branding, it's it's often that, which I'll, I'll get to in a, a second. Okay, I was going to say there's a um, it doesn't say it on the on the depiction, but for for a dev agency, branding activities maybe just paint a picture for some people of what, mm. what what it should look like and what it probably does look like. Probably two different questions, but what what sort of activities a branding person do? Well, I'm I'm going to assume there's a few things they could be in by branding. So one's being advertising campaigns that aren't asking the consumer to take a specific action. So if you think about a billboard with a nike have advertised on a billboard and there's a shoe there and it just says just do it there's no buy this shoe you don't even know what shoe it is probably it's just a shoe Mm. you know uh but there's no call to action it's just refreshing memory links effectively Mm -hmm. people often mean that and they can mean things like as part of your communications work if you're emailing a database and you're not necessarily, again, trying to sell something per email, that could be considered branding, okay. adding value. So it's sort of top of funnel awareness, broad yeah. messaging stuff. Okay, exactly. Yeah. So they may mean like brand identity documents. So right. this is uh, documents like a tone of voice, which is a blueprint of how to communicate with the brand's voice. Is the tone exciting and adventurous? Is it controlled and specific? No, not specific, scientific, should I say? And you can go into all sorts of details about that. A lot of this stuff exists on a spectrum, these documents. So you can have a a quite basic tone of voice all the way through to a super sophisticated one. Mm. And there is one publicly available that's really amazing. And it's eluding me right at this moment who the organization is that has this publicly available tone of voice. It's incredible. But if you do want it and you're listening, just email me at jack at be the push.com and I'll find it and send it to you because I, I have an example that I show people and I say, this is what great looks like, but we don't need to do that necessarily, but that's, so that's as good as it can get. From. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's sort of part of your branding just there, right? You're helpful and, and <laughs> email <laughs> I'm me. I'm doing some branding right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although I did ask them to do something. So, okay, there you go. Uh, but yeah, it could also be like a brand identity kit, which has the style guide perhaps in it, which is like your colors, your fonts, your typography, um, and that basically the rules of what's allowed in your communications and advertising. Um, and I don't think they probably mean this by branding, but they could. Uh, I'm going to assume if they've got a brand specialist, this stuff's finished mm. because I don't know what they've been doing for however long she's been there yeah. if, uh, if this stuff isn't finished, but they could mean that. Okay. So they've sort of come in, they've developed a brand kit, what you are, the guy that's going on, and now they're doing branding in parentheses mm. and uh, sort of kick in to hear what, what you think from that. Well, I, I want to cover one more thing on brand and that is there's this idea that brand can't be measured and that's not true. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So- Measuring the brand, how do you do that? What does that look like? Uh, So it can be done with what's called brand diagnostics, uh, which is the measurement. It's a measurement of a couple of things, but it can be how many people are aware of your brand, uh, the types of awareness they have, which I can break down, and the associations they have of your brand. So let's look at uh, a couple of different types of awareness, one being unaided awareness, unaided brand awareness, and one being aided brand awareness. I'll use an example of an Australian airline. If someone asked me, name some Australian airlines, and I say to you, Qantas and Virgin. So those airlines are what have unaided awareness with me. So someone asked me about the category and I could recount them. If you then said to me, well, what about Bonza? I said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I know Bonza. That was aided awareness. I didn't could be come to me. First, I, had, I need to be prompted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's what's interesting there too is I don't think Virgin actually is an Australian airline, but that doesn't matter when it comes to this stuff because the diagnostic is about what the market thinks. Gotcha. If I think of it as an Australian airline, you, the brand diagnostics about starting where you are, right? Not, not where you should be. Yeah. You know? So it's, and, it's finding what people think of you, not as opposed to where you put your category of product or ex- company. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's what's going on in their head. Yep. So diagnostic, what is happening mm-hmm. effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the marketing team could be using some diagnostics potentially, but one of the reasons for that is it is a way to show improvement in results. So if you measured your awareness, let's say at the start of the year and it was 1% of the category and then at the end of the year it's 2.5% of the category, you've shown something, right? 
it, is that really that helpful for the organization at this level? I don't think so, but it shows something and it say. could be a political thing to, for the marketing team to be able to go, look, we increased awareness 1.5% in our category. Yep. Or like an ab, sort of ammunition for investors. Look how many people know who we are, yeah. are unaided, look how amazing we are. <laughs> and the associations people have with your brand could be, just think of any adjective basically, like reliable, strong, weak, fun, exciting, boring, untrustworthy, any anything there. Very, that's very interesting. It's a personality traits like back to the whole company as well. And I think, sorry, the back end of that um, comment too about the person, they said that personality trait. Um, and I think the the example was if Nike opened up a restaurant, you know, what would that look like? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people described that it. it was all pretty similar. You know, it was mm-hmm. like dark aesthetics with neons and mm-hmm. people would look cool and it's black and sleek. And it was like, okay, well, that's the mm-hmm. brand, I guess, in people's mind. Sorry, but I interrupt. Nike, Nike opening a restaurant. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I guess with these diagnostics it's important to remember important to remember sorry that they re- represent a moment in time the natural state of memory like most things unfortunately is decay mm-hmm. and that's where consistent communication and recency is important so okay. if you just leave memories be in someone's head of a brand eventually they will decay right okay <laughs> so they're, they're naturally going to decay yes okay. yes Every, well, everything decays naturally basically so yeah typically speaking so there is interesting studies out about when brands stop advertising and and it's a if they're big brands it's a slow decline mm-hmm. but it, it does happen over time you can see that th- there is generally per year uh, an amount of advertising a bigger brand has to do just to keep their awareness like maintain their awareness basically interesting okay i love nerding out on brand it might be clear <laughs> and I wanna, i'm learning lots it's great. i want to i want to introduce one more term Again, this is from the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. I think they did pioneer this. But what they argue is that more than top of mind awareness, unaided awareness, aided awareness, this type of thing, brand salience is more important. And brand salience is the likelihood of your brand coming to mind in a buying situation. So uh, I'm going to use the Australian Airlines example again. So okay. when people do these unaided awareness awareness type surveys, so of, they're often done through what's called panel data, where a market research company will send out questions to people and they answer these questions, what Australian Airlines do you know? But they're probably sitting on their couch or they might be going for a walk or they might be at a desk. They're not buying something at that point in time. Right. So that type of awareness is considered different to to salience. So I'll give I'll give an example with the airlines as well, with myself. So Qantas might have top of mind, unaided awareness with me, right? But if I was to fly to see my family, which is a Brisbane to Albury flight, I actually used to think of JetGo in that situation when I go to buy a flight. Right. And JetGo aren't around anymore. But when a buying situation took place, JetGo had the salience with me. So the difference here is the mental cue. So if I'm cued with Australian Airlines, I think Qantas. If I'm queued with direct flight from Brisbane to Albury, I think jet go. Right. So that's the idea of salience. And also, and in the specific example I'm giving here, it's called a category entry point. So my category entry point is direct flight Brisbane to Albury. And there'll be people with, for those listening, there'll be cues that people have if they are aware of your brand that will that you want to come to mind in a buying situation. So right. Right. Um, this is kind of, this is us nerding out on brand a bit. Um, so I was going to say, just to yeah. summarize that, so is it sort of unaided in the in the level of value in that case? Aided would be less than unaided and then salient mm-hmm. would be, is probably the ideal, I guess. Like it's not so much people know about you, you want them yeah. to know about you at the right time. Yeah, it's. I wouldn't say, I definitely think unaided's better than aided. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that, it's harder to compare, say, unaided awareness to brand salience. This is debate. You know, this is debated, all this type of thing. But I kind of wanted to give the the background on a few of the nerdy, brandy things that I think it's very misunderstood. I think it's very – it's assumed that you can't measure it, mm. which isn't true. Whether you should measure it and whether AppCraft or Studio should be measuring it, we'll get into that. Mm-hmm. But it can be measured. Okay. It's not a – it's not easy to measure, but yep. it can be done. Right. And, um, and the sort of mis- the misunderstanding is that, do you think that's maybe happened here, that they've just hired a brand person because good branding is good branding and it's whatever it wants? I would, 
ask why they hired her. Because this is, I think it is important, and you've probably found this too as a consultant, but I think as anyone, if you go into a situation, you, you're better off asking first rather than <laughs> coming to the party telling everyone how wrong they are. Because it does seem like an unusual decision for them to make, in all honesty, to have a, a team of three marketers and one of them be a brand specialist. Uh, at, at higher levels for big companies, I know brand managers don't like it, but sometimes they end up just being the brand identity police, which is just making sure that all the communications is on brand effectively. All the right fonts are set up the right exactly, way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and, right and I don't think anyone likes that mm. job. Uh, brand managers more want to build the brand. They don't want to just be chastising be people the all the time. So you wouldn't need that here though so much. Like if there's one creative agency, there's, there's maybe one... Maybe one of the other marketers is doing some writing, but once you have the documents made, once you have the diagnostics done, if you're going to do them, if you've got the brand position, the strategy done, it's there's not a whole lot. There's not between. a whole lot to police. Yeah, I was going to say it sort of <laughs> yeah. sounds like particularly that size that branding is is the establishment, or at least what you think it is, the brand guides and and the, the the foundations, and then there's the measuring of brand, but everything in between sort of sounds like it's that's the outcome of what you do in the company mm, and that's mm. everything else in between. Yeah. 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 I think your brand is influenced by everything mm. that you do. And, and, you know, the big one is what people say about you, right? Yeah, right. Which, yeah, the only way you can get people to say better things is to they have good interactions things. with your brand and yeah. do a good job of what you're saying you do. it. Love it. So with this stuff, though, I think there is a spectrum of sophistication. So what makes sense for a big brand will not make sense for a startup but you have a spectrum the whole way through and as you get bigger you typically have to move to the right across that spectrum because you have to make bigger bets effectively you have to make longer term plans you have to get your plans right and so they have to be informed and the bigger you get the more agility you'll lose so Appcrafter Studios probably wants to be a little bit across that spectrum where they're a bit smarter than a startup about it, but they don't want to be so far along that they're spending so much time measuring things that they lose their agility, right. which is a, a competitive advantage over the bigger companies. Right. So it's sort of turning into dashboard checkers as opposed to yeah. actually doing the work. Exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. So my view is generally that you should make the shortest plans possible and for a big company, that's not going to be that short. Mm -hmm. But you want to use your agility as a as a smaller brand, I right. think, because um, right. one of the things you actually have. Yep, yep. And the bigger ones have to make year and year, like, you know, multi-year plans. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily, and you can adapt faster. So for a company of this size, so 15 million revenue AUD, uh, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a brand specialist to me. It might be a bit different for a $15 million company in FMCG, for example, right. a lot of rapid purchases with customers, a lot more customers. There's going to be like a massive, a lot more quantity of customers because they're all spending a lot less each. Right. Yep. Uh, so there'd be a different argument there. But we, we're talking about something that's a single, not necessarily single because there's recurring revenue there, but they're big purchases, mm -hmm. right? They're High big, ticket, low volume. Yeah, yep. big, yep. Con long consideration times and... But the other reason the marketing team could be pushing something like this is that they like Emma. She might be liked and uh, they're trying to justify her position. And sometimes when we have these branding type talks, it can be a way for marketing teams to duck accountability, in all honesty. If the rest of the people aren't aware of brand diagnostics, if they can't afford the brand diagnostics, which they probably can't, they can kind of get a bit wishy-washy with mm -hmm. you know what they're doing and the impact they're having. You're always going to probably find some metric to to point to to say, hey, look how much better we're doing. Yep, yep. So if we just say keep doing branding, I put that in inverted commas, uh, that might be a reason. And it could even be a, um, a sort of matter of I think people stick to what they know too yeah. sometimes, and particularly if they're stressed, they're on the pump. It's like people rely on the fundamentals of what they're good at. And it's if, if branding's a thing and, and maybe the CEO, Sarah, doesn't know marketing well. Mm. So she goes, well, Emma's a great person and she's stuck with us all these years. Let's just lean into what she says. And so it's a it's a sick trap. It comes from a good place, but it's a sick trap sometimes. I agree. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Totally agree. So, Interesting. So, but will leads happen for them if with good branding and by good branding, if marketing mean advertising without calls to action, communicating without calls to action, this type of thing, not trying to push people along the buying process effectively. Will um, 
will they just happen? Now, because they're having the conversation, I'm going to assume that it's not happening. Mm. <laughs> well, because if sales are getting grumpy, they're not growing. Mm -hmm. You'd assume maybe it's not happening. Just uh, like it's not flowing from brand recognition to purchase. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a, because otherwise marketing have proven their point anyway. So if it was effective and it clearly was effective well, uh, by now yeah mm. but uh considering it's a point of contention i'm going to assume that there's not a whole lot of tangible evidence that it's it's helping now the caveat i'm going to put in here with the random chaotic world we live in is that there may be five there may be ten big clients or big prospects just about to buy it's possible it's possible. Likely story. <laughs> but I have a tip to navigate this specificity, and it's a great tool for B2B businesses to use, I think. And of all the engaged people in your email list who are relevant, reach out to them and get a feel for what's going on with them. And this can show you people who are not far off buying. If someone comes back and goes, yeah, are we actually... We are actually interested in a few months. Yeah, that would be a conversation we're wanting to have. Uh, but it also brings some more tangibility to the pipeline. So for the most part, people or prospects aren't going to tell you, hey, I want to buy from you in six months. Mm -hmm. They're just going to read your stuff and they're going to stay on the list or they're going to read your website or yep. wait till and they're then ready. They're not going to say, they're not going to go out of their way to tell you that we're coming. <laughs> you know, that's not, it's not fill the pipeline. Yeah, we'll soon. yeah, yeah. I'm not going to just, they don't reach out to you just to help you yep. understand who's coming along. So this is a way to contact them and get the information out of their head and into the company's hands. Right. So there's an idea. Uh, you can justify it, this type of outreach with companies like this because of the high LTVs. So large lifetime values, some manual outreach to engaged people mm. is completely justified yeah because i guess yeah. if there's one win out of that exactly the, that are always worth it yeah. yeah if you're selling a 20 dollars product it might be a bit harder mm. to justify i agree <laughs> i agree yeah so i think we've covered that part there so the sales team also thinks that marketing should be talking to customers now should they <laughs> interesting what uh, do you think someone asked you <laughs> uh, i'm going to differentiate between customers and prospects yep. because prospects are people that you know of that have indicated they might buy at some point in time, customers being people that have bought or are buying from you. Mm -hmm. So do marketing teams need to speak to prospects? I don't think they necessarily do, but there may be some nuance here. If there's if there are inbound leads coming in and sales are flat out doing some outbound stuff or they just are doing other things and marketing let, are letting leads go cold, knowing damn well that sales aren't going to get to them for the next two weeks, mm -hmm. I kind of think that's poor form. Yep, I agree. So unless there's something like that happening, I don't think it's that important that marketing do talk to prospects. But is there, on that saying that, is there a difference between, because I think talking to customers is like the twofold of mm. gathering data and then progressing sales. I think I think everyone in the whole company needs to be across the market. Do you, do you think it's marketing being involved? It's like a, a fly on the wall to stuff, just to observe data, or do you think they're better off yeah. retaining that internally? It or? could be useful. Um, what what I was going to say is, I think sales need to bring back the insights from those discussions with prospects. Yep. And and it's really surprising how rarely this happens. You mm. know, the one takeaway from this episode, if you want nothing else, is get sales and marketing working together. You Agreed. know, it seems. Seems basic, but it just kind of doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So what I what I generally say is I think sales ideally bring back insights from prospects, mm -hmm. put it back into the company. Marketing, I think they should be talking to customers, especially in this example where you're churning these new customers like it's your job. What the hell is going on there, mm -hmm. honestly? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, your recurring revenue is great at Crafter Studios. So what's going so well there? And I would also be wanting to know how can we bring in more customers that are likely to be recurring customers too because if the new customers are just coming but churning you got to assume they're doing a project and then getting pissed off and leaving uh they're not becoming recurring yep. customers so that's that's what i'd be i'd be looking at that was my was gonna be my question to you too around recurring is always the golden egg mm. right and it's like if six million is coming in and out really quickly that nine i think you just said it then where the nine come from how did it work and how do we <laughs> turn those six into the nine exactly and, yeah, and, keep yeah. and in this scenario you'd assume that's not happening mm. i assume that people aren't talking to them yeah because it seems bizarre Interesting. it seems very strange that would be my assumption i could be wrong okay but 
the marketing team and the marketing skill set is well placed to talk to those customers and get insights. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you do have to talk to them. So I kind of agree with sales there. I'm sorry, marketing, if you think I'm a turncoat, but that's a, <laughs> I do tend to agree at the general level. And is that, yeah. it's, I was going to say one last question, we'll move to the next one. Is there sales and marketing, we laughed before, it happens quite frequently. Why do you think that is? It, it, yeah. Sort of more than just this singular situation, mm. but across consistently is it cats yeah. and dogs like why why yeah why does that happen i think incentive structures okay. can get in the way sometimes so if sales teams or sales individuals are incentivized based on individual performance they're then incentivized to make things look like it was just them even if they this person's been on the email list for six months and uh They've read a, a white paper and watched they've watched a webinar. webinar and... <laughs> yeah, you know, the salesperson's incentivized to go, that was me. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, so that would be one reason. There's another reason would be in some companies, they report up different lines for some reason. I, I really think it's strange, but if I get into a situation like that, it's really hard to turn that around because the reporting structures are just off kilter, basically. Right. In, in an ideal world, this is my radical part, is I think that they should be one team. Mm. Sales and marketing are one team, which would mean they report to one person, right. which could be a CMO or it could be a national sales manager or director of sales or something like that. Okay. Because those two, those two roles are actually a lot more similar to me than what a lot of people would give them credit for. Agree. Uh, they're, they're different at the tactical level, but strategically and the understanding of the market, the diagnostics and the strategy side of it, Director of sales, CMO, very similar knowledge they need. They Absolutely. need to know how people buy. They mm. need to understand their market. They need to then be able to delegate you know, activity to the teams below them. Mm. And, and your sales are going to be the team that does the one-on-ones, clearly. And marketing are going to do things at more scale, basically. Right. But a lot of the time, sales shouldn't necessarily be doing awareness. You know, That's not really a smart thing a lot of the time. But they end up doing that. Because um, there's another scary stat that the B2B LinkedIn Institute did a study last year. And on average, 16% of targeting between sales and marketing overlaps within the same company. What, 16, 1, 6? 1, 6, yeah. Wow. And it does sound crazy, but I've seen it many times, so it doesn't surprise me. Mm. So there's a huge opportunity here just to work together. Right. Really is. And uh, it seems basic, um, but if you can break the silo and you can foster a culture of respect don't call the marketing team the coloring in department they they hate that mm. don't think that sales are just a bunch of boneheads who don't know anything about the market mm. which can be a perception from marketing to them or you, you don't you don't get it they're the ones talking to the people on the front line listen to them absolutely and that's great qualitative data great qualitative data so if there is a culture of respect if you can bring them together magic can happen and Yes, Sarah, if, if, you may find this a bit radical, but if you start listening to customers, if you listen to prospects, if you share that information freely between the marketing and sales departments, as I said, magic happens. These departments, they help people buy. That's what they do. That's it. So they need to work together to help people along that conveyor belt effectively. Very um, well said. And uh, I, I do generally refer to sales as an outcome. Mm. And, and I encourage that culture wherever I go to think of sales as an outcome because it, it takes away that kind of hero mindset of yep. the, the sales team. But again, as we said before, with the incentives in place, with the, just the culture of the industry in the last however many years, decades of business, you know, things just come to be. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So that would be what I'd, I'd say. I've talked about things um, in an ideal world. I think the... The brand strategist is a generous, generous to have that as a full-time role here. But there's other things she could be doing. Like Emma could be talking to the customers. She could be doing some product marketing. She could be making sure that the the website's got those credibility indicators, the yep. uh, testimonials, doing case that studies. research with the customers, as you said. Like exactly. Getting them on that. Yep. Yeah, working out what's going on with the recurring, what's going on with the, the new customers. Like there'll be heaps of areas I would prefer to redeploy re her. Mm, mm. She can do a li little bit of brand still perhaps, but mostly not. Uh, and she probably isn't going to be a fan of me after this, but sorry, Emma, uh, that's See, what I it's think. It's not about you, Emma, it's about growing yeah. the company. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no idea why it came to be like this and I would find that out and I would try and figure out yeah, how that's all working together. But that's my 
thoughts at Crafter Studio. Awesome. Yeah. And so the, um, the it's not growing together. The sales and marketing team aren't working together. So Sarah wants to know what you think they should be measuring as a last question. So we're going to cover that in an upcoming episode. Okay. Sarah, Good. I will tell you what to measure in an upcoming episode. We'll stick with this example in this case study, this hypothetical, whatever you want to call it. And Sarah, I'm also going to help you out when your marketing and sales team admit to you that they actually don't know why the results have been so poor <laughs> and why the brand isn't going growing. And yeah, this would never happen in reality, but yeah, yeah. we'll do a we'll do a theoretical episode about what would you do if the team said, yeah, okay, we don't know what's wrong. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. Well, it's a good CTA then, right? We're going to leave for the yeah. and wait for next yeah. week. Make sure you subscribe and uh, we'll talk more about AppCrafter Studios in a, in a couple of episodes time. Awesome. Thanks, Jack. Super riveting. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> awesome, mate. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Push Podcast. Please remember to subscribe. And if you are enjoying the episodes, please leave a review of the podcast on your platform of choice. It really helps to build the podcast credibility and to help others find this type of information.